Welcome to After the Final Whistle, where we talk current topics in the world of sports. I'm your host, Bree Houston, alongside Kirkland Bell and Ashan Dyed. Exciting topics coming up later in the show. Stick with us for another round of pop-up. Justin Wagner with insight to the NCAA. And we, we spotlight an APSU student, sportscaster, and lots more. Now let's jump into the NFL. The NFL voted at their annual meeting to allow defensive and offensive pass interference to be called and to be reviewed. This also includes pass interference that are not called by the referees. Guys, what do you guys think about that? I think this is a, a great rule change to the fact that what happened to in the uh, Patriots game versus the Rams, that could have been reviewed, play could have been fixed, and problem would have been solved. So in that in that instance of the game, I think that's a good thing. Uh, you mean Saints by the Rams all the way, but um, I disagree <laughs> with the rule actually. Uh, I, I think this rule was made in a, on a very personal level and I don't think this is going to be a good rule for the NFL. The NFL is already a slow game. It's very slow. It's terribly slow. And I think this rule allows it to be even slower, and I think it allows the outcome of games to be predetermined. Like Richard Sherman, Richard Sherman said, if referees have this power they, to determine games, we will see it a lot more. Well, in, in that sense, yes, but I don't think the rule is going to be used in that sense. I think because they only have a certain amount of – challenges for this rule as well and then I believe it's a penalty if, if they do get it wrong so I mean you take it a risk either way if you get it right you win if you lose if you do get it wrong then you lose as well so I, I think it's a good rule for both parties I think but it will slow down the game that's the one negative part about it though I, I do agree with you on that aspect right and football is already slow so you, to make it even slower trying to review every single you can review rules that weren't even called so I think that just brings in, it's too much of a gray area with this rule that should not be there. So I think this rule is too much of a personal thing with the Saints coach. I think he was very upset with the game. I guess he should be, they did get cheated out of that game, but I think this rule just brings too much, too many different, it's a slippery slope, so. Definitely a slippery slope, definitely a slippery slope, but hey, the NFL voted it in, so they're gonna move on and we're gonna see how it goes. Well, one thing we can agree on is viewership for the NFL has declined over the past few years with all the rule changes, the celebrations. They just brought celebration back actually last year, but uh, it's still a regulation on how they celebrate. But one thing we can also agree with is one team that will benefit from this rule is the Patriots. We all know they benefit from everything every single year. But will their dynasty continue to benefit, especially with the recent retirement of Rob Gronkowski? Okay. I'll, I'll start. Uh, no, the Patriots will not benefit from this rule because they never benefit. They benefit from rules, but they never had this problem. But the, their dynasty will not be their dynasty is gone. Uh, Rob was the reason for that dynasty. He had the most targets last year from Tom Brady, if I'm reading this correctly. And um, he should have retired two years ago. This is what I think. I think he should have retired two years ago. Uh, he's had injury after injury. He, you know, CT is a thing now, so he, he's done. I don't think he comes back. I know Tom Brady has been trying to get him to come back, if I'm reading this correctly. I, don't, I think he's done. He, he's got to go. He's got to go. I think due to injury th this year, he was up and down season for him. I think the really was the right decision for him to retire and uh, preserve his body and while he's young and move on so he can uh, actually enjoy life without any uh, bumps and bruises. Um, the dynasty, I personally think if the Patriots in the division that they're in, they'll be in the playoffs again because in the AFC East, it's like a weak division in my eyes because they have the Jets, the Bills, and then they have the Dolphins, which always have top 10 draft picks every year. So all you got to win is eight, nine games over there, you'll be back in the playoffs. So they'll be in the playoff hunt, but as far as winning the Super Bowl, I don't know about that. And after eight, <laughs> eight years, I mean, he's, that's a long enough career for an NFL football player. Yeah. Know? I don't think he can what, – what more does he have to prove? He's one of the best tight ends ever, so I, I, don't, I just don't think he has anything left to prove at this point. He's got, he's got his rings, got his stats. But go live a happy life, you know. I, I agree. Moving on, Kirk, can you tell us what's going on in the NBA? Uh, yes, I can. Now it's time for a look up at the NBA playoff standings. As we inch closer to the NBA, playoff teams are dropping like flies, and that includes LeBron James, who will not be in the playoffs this year. That is right. All eight spots in the Western Conference have been locked in. 
with the Golden State Warriors and the Denver Nuggets battling for the one and two seed. Houston and Portland battling for the third seed, while spots five through eight are up for grabs between Utah, San Antonio, OKC, and the Los Angeles Clippers, not the Lakers. Meanwhile, in the East, the Milwaukee Bucks will finish the season as the league's best team. Toronto, Boston, Indiana, and Philadelphia have all locked their positions in the playoffs, leaving three spots up for grabs for teams like Miami, Brooklyn, and Orlando. But, Charlotte also has a spot in there as well. Okay, um, first of all, I have to say, I don't like how you kept emphasi emphasizing that LeBron wasn't gonna make it to the playoffs. I apologize. Disrespect. <laughs> That's disrespect, next, ladies and gentlemen. Up next, we take a look as ATFW takes to the sidewalks of Austin P just to pop up. Hi, I'm Anna Claire, and this is Pop Up. Let's jump right into the NCAA tournament. A few weeks ago, Duke played UFC. That game had more than 13 million viewers. That's more than any NBA team this season. The question is, should NCAA student athletes be paid? I'll start off. Um, I think they should, but I think it's very hard to do that. <clears throat> uh, let me just start by showing John Calipari was given a lifetime contract to Kentucky. I feel like if they can give him a lifetime contract to a school, they can pay athletes. He makes $9.2 million a year right now. With a lifetime contract, there's no telling how much he makes. And he only has one championship. Can we, can we, he has one championship. He makes $9.2 million. Mm. Coach K at Duke has five championships. He makes $7 million. He's not even, he doesn't have a lifetime contract. So why are these coaches getting paid all these millions of dollars for one championship? I believe the student athletes should be paid because you're selling my likeness, you're, you're, you're selling out arenas, the ratings, you have billion dollar TV contracts, you have people betting on the Final Four every year, gambling is almost legal almost in every state almost, they haven't opened it up yet, but I'm just saying like, there's money there to be made for the student athletes, so I just think that they should be paid, you know, because they can't get a job because they have on a scholarship, so what are you supposed to do? And if they can't get paid, let's say they can't get paid, because I know it's going to be hard. Everybody wants to get paid. You got D2, D3 athletes that want to get paid, too. So let the students make money on their own name. Every time the school uses their the student's picture on a billboard, let the student get the funds from that. Um, and just John Calipari, because I'm still upset about this lifetime contract. <laughs> he, he has one championship, OK? Roy Williams. One championship. Roy Williams at UNC has three championships, <laughs> and he makes under $4 million. John Calipari makes $9.2 million, was offered a lifetime contract to Kentucky. The best coaches in college basketball do not have a lifetime contract. He doesn't deserve a lifetime contract. No coach deserves a lifetime contract in college basketball. 
except Coach K. If anybody gets one, it's Coach K for what he does at Duke. I just don't. I just. Speaking of some of the teams that you brought up, the North Carolina and Duke game, one of the biggest rivalries in college basketball. Uh, the tickets, the least, the tickets that were the least at that game was reportedly three thousand dollars. There was a ticket uh, that was on sale that was for ten thousand dollars, and the players who bring all of these people to the games are not getting paid. Some of them are going home wondering, like, dang, how am I going to get? you know, yep. this money to pay for this or that. Yes, they have scholarships. Yes, I'm pretty sure they get stipends, but that's not enough. Sometimes you need money to do other things. And I'm a, I'll be upset if I'm playing in the game and I see all of these people coming to watch me and they pay thousands of dollars for a college basketball ticket, but yet I don't get compensated for it. Yeah, it's, I don't know, it's, it's weird. It's, but they can give lifetime contracts to you know, coaches, but the students don't see a penny. You know? Kirk in so his lifetime contract. Calipari, you better watch out because Kirk's coming after your lifetime yeah, contract. Yeah, he's coming after your lifetime contract. <laughs> I just don't think. And they're going to make him an ambassador after his lifetime contract is done. So he still gets a say in what happens in the school. So I'll just, does anybody have that much power in any college? That John, right now? I guess it's because the players he brings. And he kind of changed the, the game of basketball the with the one and done situation. And yes. He has type of players who you know next year they're going to the NBA. So oh, that's maybe that's a, a factor. Win is not his reputation. His reputation is sending players to, to the, the NBA. NBA. That's, his, that's his reputation. Yeah. As long yeah, as they, they can get them to that school, get a few ratings, go to the tournament, it could be a, a, a competition and Final Four, that's all they want. As far as winning the championship, that's irrelevant because as long as that school, school's in the spotlight, it's they're going to make money. Yeah, because he's definitely not a winner. I mean, Tom Izzo <laughs> has one championship, and he's making $4 million too. So, I mean, Roy Williams has $4 million contract, ladies and gentlemen. He has See, $4 million. See, the thing about Roy Williams is he, he hasn't had a, a top 10 NBA draft pick in probably like seven years. You know what he does have? Three champions. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, staying in the madness, let's talk Final Four. Whose brackets are still intact? I know last week I sat here and I said I had Duke to win it all, so you know where my bracket is in the trash currently, probably with thousands of others. I have my bracket right here, and my Final Four was Duke, Tennessee, Gonzaga, and North Carolina, so I'm just going yeah, to. Yeah, go ahead and throw, throw that in. <laughs> let me help you. Yeah, let me it. It is it's it's trash. Yes, it's my trash. Bracket is trash. Yes. My bracket's terrible right now, too. My bracket's terrible. I had Duke, North Carolina. Uh, Gonzaga, and then I had uh, uh, you. Uh, that's it. I, I didn't pick a, a third team because it was tossed between Virginia and uh, Tennessee. You know whose bracket is probably still intact. You know the people each year who sit down and pick teams off of the colors of the mascots. <laughs> they go the furthest <laughs> in the tournament, and it bugs me so much. I'm like, you don't even know basketball, but yet your your bracket. It's pretty much on point. I think we concentrate too hard on, yeah, on the matchups, the numbers, the rankings. You know what team that I'm that. really surprised about is <laughs> Auburn. That's I, a big surprise. I'm really surprised. That, I'm, I, real I, surprise. I like watching them play. Uh, I love the coach, Bruce Pearl. He's, he's no a great coach. Um, <laughs> he used to coach at Tennessee, you know. And, yeah. But Rick Barnes is doing a great job at Tennessee. But I really enjoy watching Auburn play. So I hope they're the, they're the team I'm cheering for now. So I have to cheer for Auburn now. Because my team is out, Duke, is lo Duke lost to Michigan State, one of the two of the best coaches in college basketball, making less than John Calipari. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and they don't have a lifetime one, uh, a lifetime contract yeah, either. Exactly. So. Yeah, no, no maybe lifetime this is, contract. Maybe this is a movement. Like we'll see more coaches get lifetime contracts. I hope not. All right, now Justin, over to you with the insight with the NCAA package. March is over, but the madness continues. This weekend, the Final Four teams face off with a national championship so close they can taste it. We have the Spartans of Michigan State, which happens to be the only team with a recent history of making it to the Final Four. Their last visit being in 2015, the Spartans are set to take on Texas Tech. What Michigan State needs in this matchup is just some more of the same. In the last two games, the Spartans have only turned the ball over seven times. That mix with great defense and powerful play inside could propel them to their fourth national championship appearance. Standing in their way, three seed Texas Tech, making their first Final Four appearance in school history, and I think they've surprised everyone with their tournament run so far. They've made it to the Final Four not with scoring, but the ability to keep the other team from scoring. 
A strong Michigan team was held to just 44 points in the Sweet 16 by the Red Raiders. The only team able to score more than 60, the number one seed Zags in the Elite Eight. That defense combined with probable lotto pick Jarrett Culver and three-point capability of sophomore guard David Moretti, it's anybody's game, but I'm going Michigan State. On the other side of the bracket, let's start with Virginia. The only one seed in the Final Four, you can talk about all the things that they do right all day long. They led the nation in points given up per game. They had the lowest turnover rate with nine, and in the regular season, they lit it up from behind the arc. But they just haven't played with a lot of consistency in the tournament, and they're one of the leading teams in giving up the three ball. I want to call Auburn the Cinderella story, but that's just based on the Auburn we're all used to. This Auburn team won the SEC tournament and has taken down three of the winningest programs in NCAA history. And they did it back to back to back, taking out Kansas, North Carolina, and Kentucky. So I'm rolling with Auburn over Virginia. I'm Justin Wagner, and thank you for watching ATFW College Basketball Update. Welcome and thank you for watching After the Final Whistle. I'm Madeline Migliaccio here with Aaron King, where we are spotlighting one of our very own student sportscasters from the APSU comm department. Aaron, how are you doing? I'm, I'm amazing. Better that I'm here. Better? Good. I'm <laughs> glad you're here too. Now, just to get started, my first question is, I wanted to know how you got started in the program. Um, was it something that you did in high school or is it something that you started when you got to Austin P? Well, to be honest with you, I think I really started this in high school because um, when I was a senior, I was a senior at Clarksville High School, just down the road, and we all know now that Barry has a class where, uh, Barry Gresham has a class where he'll take a van out, it's a really nice van. He'll go out to all the uh, Austin P High School Game of the Weeks, and well, just that week I was there just kind of filming the game for, I guess, athletics for Clarksville, uh, Clarksville High at the time. And I saw Barry's van. I'm like, this is awesome. This is something that I want to try to get into. And he, he talked to me about it. I you know, saw the people up in the, up in the booth commentating it. I was so exciting to be a part of it. He actually got let me man a camera and all that stuff. He let me go inside the van. So I think that was really the origin of um, w when I actually wanted to be you know, kind of broadcasting. That's kind of what the, the hook line and mm -hmm. sinker type deal. So. I think so. Was there necessarily like a moment or just like an experience that you did that really validated everything you were doing? I think it's less of a single experience and more of a, a, a continuous occurrence of experiences because they continue to have me as talent for the major games. And I think that's kind of my, um, that's kind of my signal as how hey, you're doing something right. Was there someone or something that like inspires you to stay motivated? I think just the the ability to um, okay so for example you know I have my show Real Talk. Hello everybody and welcome back to Real Talk I'm Aaron King and I love that I love that show I love the people that I've been on it with you know Marcus Emmett even Bobby last year uh, you know love those guys they make it so fun but I think the actual um, I think the actual idea of having my own show and controlling my own show and all that stuff, it's, it's super fun to me. That's really what I want to do. Calling games is great, but I want my own show. I want my own talk show like on the radio or some simulcast, Sirius XM or something like that. That's kind of my dream. I want my own sports talk show. So then when I uh, hear about you know radio, uh, local stations and stuff like that that want me to come in and be a part of that, just the idea of the opportunity to have my own actual radio show, that's kind of what keeps me going on. Out of all of the classes you've taken, even including general educations, has there been any of them that are front runners that you felt like like really paved the way? Everything Barry Gresham teaches is absolutely amazing. It, it really is. It really is. It, because a lot of his classes make you actually go to games as credits. And when you go to games, they just kind of throw you to the coals and say walk or throw you in the deep end and say swim. And that's the best way to learn, I think. So you can't, you can't really read a book and know what to be prepared for inside the studio. So I, I really enjoyed that. What would you say to like upcoming freshmen we have or people that are transferring into the department, you've been involved since you got started. What would you say to them as like kind of like a last, last words? Trust the process. I'd have to say, trust the process. It's, it's a long one, um, but in the end, it will work. And 
you, you kind of just think, oh, man, it's just these, there's so many basketball games. I'm just kind of doing this just because I'm here, because they're giving me a scholarship and because I, I like the people around me. But, man, these, oh, my, my back hurts from this baseline camera or this, this stand keeps shaking on the high and wide. Or, you know, the producer keeps yelling at me. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Yeah, well, they're just prepping you for the real time, prepping you for the, when the lights get a little bit brighter you know, and it's time to really start buckling down when you're in those professional sports or even when you're just on TV, this process works. And I think, um, I don't want to sound self-centered, but I, I think I can be kind of a, an example of that because I didn't think that I would progress as much as I have or as much as I, I've done so far. Um, I wouldn't have done it without this. So it's, you know, trust the process because it works. Ladies and gentlemen, Aaron King, thank you so much. Yeah. Our student sportscaster of the week, Thank you. Welcome to Pop Quiz, where two contenders face off for the rapid fire 10 question showdown. Today, going head to head is Justin Wagner and Hunter Sanders. Whoever gets the most out of 10 correct answers wins. Number one, who is leading the NBA in most points per game? James Harden. James Harden, he got it. One for Hunter. <laughs> Number two, who is the voice of the Nashville Predators? Oh, gosh, I don't know. That. Pete Weber. Pete Weber, oh, wow. he got it. Wow. Number three, who is the highest played player in the, player in the MLB? Mike Trout. Mike Trout, good one. So I've got, what is it, two to one. How many consecutive Final Four appearances has UConn women's basketball made? I think that was Justin. Come on. Was it? Give it to me. Do you have an answer? Three? 22. Two? Mm, what's your answer? 12. 12, he got it. Uh. He got it. Number five, which NFL team won the first two Super Bowls in 1967 and 1968? Packers. The Green Bay Packers, good one. <clears throat> Number six, which basketball team is well known for their comic antics as well as their skill? Mm. Harlem Globetrotters. The Harlem Globetrotters, he got it. Number seven, which country has played in each and every World Cup? I totally hit it. Didn't get the ball. Ah, what is it? Brazil. Brazil. Yeah. Number eight, what future Hall of Fame tight end was drafted by the New England Patriots in 2010? He just retired and it's Gronkowski. It's Gronkowski and he did just retire. Number nine, the sports scandal was known as Skategate. Which figure skater was stripped of her 1994? Tanya Harding. Tanya Harding. Boom. Got it. Last question. Number 10, According to many Super Bowl MVPs, what is their preferred destination? Disney World. Disney World. Disney World is Wait, 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 wait. That's not true. It's not true? Disneyland. Oh, my goodness. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I was mistaken. Whoa. Let's check it out. It There's two Disneyland. of them. I think it might be Disney World. There's two of them. Let's check it out. I'll have to fact out. check, and we'll have to double check with that. How many did you get, Hunter? Well, five or six. Five or six? <laughs> The same. The same. False. Okay, well, I'd have to four, say. Four or five. I'd have to say that the winner is actually going to be Hunter Sanders, and he just took the gold for a pop quiz. Thank you much, and we appreciate it. Now back to you. The Austin Peay softball team won both doubleheaders this weekend with wins against Belmont on Friday and wins against Tennessee State on Sunday. Pitcher Morgan Rackle was awarded OBC Player of the Week for her first time. Rackle has also been named OBC Pitcher of the Week four times so far in her career. The guys play today at 4 p.m. at North Alabama, then turn around and play at Jacksonville State for the start of OBC play Friday at 1 and 3 p.m. Now the Austin Peay baseball team also had a strong weekend as they took down the number one ranked Belmont with a 2-1 series win, allowing the Guffs to take a first place standing in the OBC. The Guffs played Tuesday night at Lipscomb, losing in a walk-off home run 9-8. But APSU will play Eastern Kentucky this weekend with games tomorrow at 5 p.m., Saturday at 3 p.m., and Sunday at noon. The games will also be available on ESPN+. Now the APSU women's tennis team continued their 14-0 winning streak this weekend after beating Jacksonville State 7-0 in OBC play. The Govs won in doubles and singles, shutting out JSU. Claudia Giannis Garcia earned her second OBC Player of the Week honor from her performance. Austin P will play Southeast Missouri State Friday at noon at home. Now lastly, the Austin P football team has their red and white scrimmage Saturday at 11 a.m. Come out and support and see what new head coach Hud Speth has been doing with the team this spring. This has been your AP Two, your AP two Minute Sports Drill. Now back to you guys. All right, for our hot topic of the day, thank you Bryce, for our hot topic of the day, the Big baller brand is in trouble. Allegedly, co-founder Alan Foster stole $1.5 million from Lakers star Lonzo Ball. Ashan, do you think the company will still be in existence this time next year? 
Yes, I believe so. I believe so. Get rid of the, uh, the bad apple, and uh, you can continue moving on with the business. Well, I, I kind of question that because Lonzo Ball covered up his big baller brand That's tattoo it. with uh, a couple of dice. If it was going to be in existence still, don't you think he would still be rocking the tattoo? Kirk? Uh, no, Big Baller Brand is done. It's a wrap. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, <laughs> might, might I add that the dice that he covered up would look terrible, but it, <clears throat> it's, it's it, no, Big Baller Brand is a wrap. And it's because uh, LeVar Ball uh, stretched himself too thin. He has too many people working too many jobs. He's trying to get three sons to the NBA. And might I add, two sons aren't very good. But he's trying to get, and the third one is a maybe. He's a maybe right now for the Lakers. But, um, yeah, they're not very good. So, yeah, I, the big baller brand is over. They have terrible reviews on the Better Business Bureau. I mean, they're not going to be in business next year. Just a, no, no, no. <laughs> I think they'll be in business. Just for the simple fact, LeBron, LeVar Ball is like a great salesman, pitchman, and things of that nature. He says that the, the, the brand is still going to stay alive. And maybe if he t uh, renders some of his creative control over the brand and maybe try to work with other brand name comp shoe companies and collaborate with them, maybe they could survive. That's what I think. That's what I think he should go. I agree with that. <clears throat> But I just, I don't think LeVar Ball is a great businessman. I think he's a great hype man. That's what that, I mean. Yeah. But uh, he, the guy, uh, I forgot his name, the guy he hired to be the financial expert for Alan Foster. Alan Foster. Yeah, Alan Foster, the guy he hired to be. Alan Foster was already a felon when he hired him. He already had, had charges for money laundering, embezzlement, and things like that. So, yeah. It, they use very bad judgment. Yes, to, terrible judgment. To hire a guy who sold him a dream and... Robbed him blind. Yes. Hey, he robbed him, robbed him blind. All right. I mean, Lonzo's only making, what, five million? He didn't even have to go to like the bank. He used the gun. He, used the, he just used the computer, wiretap, huh? Right. Well, <laughs> well, we might not agree with how he, his tactics, but we can agree with he does keep his boys very relevant. When they first came into the <clears throat> NBA spotlight, who did we hear? LaVar. LaVar. My son's better than... Steph Curry, I'm better than Jordan. You know, he was very consistent with staying into the spotlight. So, I mean, maybe, I don't know, is, is this real? Or yeah, is, are, are, we, are, we being, listen, are we being punked? Listen, the Ball brothers aren't great basketball players. I'm iffy on Lonzo, Lonzo as you're a not, Lakers You're fan. not a fan of his roundup shot? I'm not a fan of his at all. <laughs> or, uh, I know right now LeVar is talking about uh, the youngest brother, Leangelo. He's pretty good. Though. LaMelo, I'm sorry. He's... Le LeVar said he's going to go to Australia to play basketball. That's not the NBA. So, and he's not getting scouted by any D1 colleges right now. So, um, and I don't even know where LiAngelo is. Like, he's supposed to be playing in the NBA Development League, but I haven't seen him. So, I Well, don't... have you thought maybe because these teams don't want to deal with his, their dad? The stunt he pulled, he pulled them out of high school, took them overseas for a year. They almost couldn't get back into high school because they were pro, considered pro players. So he's just he does a lot that really kind of mess up the messes up the career that his boys could potentially have. Honestly, I think if he was to focus on one aspect of their careers, the basketball aspect or the uh, financial aspect, one of something would excel. But he can't do everything. Yeah, he tried to here, and it's messed him up. I just personally think he they need another creative director over there. They need better creative people who makes better decisions. Like he needs a more better team around him as far as the big baller brand, more better uh, advisors, people who have been in the industries and give him advice instead of thinking he knows everything or he read a self-help book that can help <laughs> him through this industry because there's no self-help book that's gonna get you through this. Nike and Adidas have been in this business for a long time. And I read uh, an article that says Lonzo Ball was signing with another shoe company. I don't know how real that is, but if that is true, then the big, big ball that's brand true, is yeah, over. That's true, yeah, it's over. I will Chinese, have to retract my statement. Some Chinese, that's true. Some Chinese shoe company? That would be the only people He'll I think a, would hire He'll pull a, a D-Wade and <laughs> leave a, a big brand and go to a Chinese company? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would. This has been a, uh, this has been after the final whistle. We will be back bringing you more current topics in the world of sports. From everyone here at ATFW, thanks for watching. Until next time.